Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Joyce and I'm going to be talking to you um, this week about something called the Ripple Technique um, and it is from the Himmel and Himmel book. They talk about it a bit in chapter 10 and then it's exemplified in the appendix section. There's two worksheets on page 172 and 73 um, about the Ripple Technique and I'm going to be talking about how you can use this to build a total participatory technique conducive classroom, which is the point of chapter 10 um, for Himmel and Himmel, and then also um, relating that to how Cassetta and Sawyer talk about in chapter one of their book, um, learning who your students are and valuing diversity in the classroom. So first for some context, um, from Hemel and Hemel, they talk about to build a TPT conducive classroom, you need to do a couple of things as a teacher. You should be intentional and be mindful um, in the strategies that you're employing and also be consistent. So once you begin a strategy or um, begin a certain practice in your classroom, as far as the way you manage it and run things, that you should be consistent in that so that your students can expect that from you. Um, also to shape the opportunities in the environment. Uh, the way you do that will reflect on whether or not all students get involved and are included or whether some students are still left out and kind of sitting on the sidelines. Um, also, um, they promote the idea of teachers allowing students to think freely and kind of learn how to um, think critically and to do things better, finding new strategies. Um, so continuing with some of that context, going to Cassetta and Sawyer, that first chapter we read this week, they talk about how you should learn who your students are and um, talk about different forms of identity, race, ethnicity, class, gender, socioeconomic status, nationality, getting to know those different identities and the composition of your classes um, is going to help you to be that much more effective and aware of your student population in your classroom. And that teachers should also learn some about their students' lives in general. Um, this helps to build trust, not only between teachers and students, but also between students and their peers. Um, and then just to build off of that, Himmel and Himmel also resonated that um, teachers should appreciate those differences within their students and create a classroom space where differences are valued. Um, going back to um, the Himmel and Himmel chapter, they talk about the idea of fostering student collaboration. So kids need time to talk with each other, to learn from each other, and share ideas. Um, and that students have a unique opportunity in the classroom to interact with other students from different social groups other than their own. And you don't always get that opportunity in everyday life in the real world, so the classroom is really a unique space for that. Um, and then also the idea of managing peer reject rejection and acceptance that um, teachers can create an environment where students can feel safe and valued in participation. And again, going back to that idea that students who might seat themselves on the periphery of the class or kind of avoid discussion, not raise their hand, um, teachers need to figure out strategies to create opportunities and a space for inclusion for those students too. So, Given all of that, the ripple technique is a way to do all of those things. Um, again, you can find the worksheets on page 172 and 73 if you want to follow along. Um, but some benefits is that it eases students into discussions, um, gives students time to think about their answers and what they want to say before they have to say it out loud to everyone else. Um, that they can share it initially in a low risk situation. So their ideas are first traded just between their groups instead of to the whole class. And then you build up to that group setting, which can be more daunting for some students. Um, so the model is basically three steps. First, students would receive a prompt 
um, some kind of question or something, some kind of prompt related to your topic area, and they would address it on their own, either writing about it or jotting down some ideas. Um, and then the second step is that students would come together, share and compare those ideas in small groups. And then third, students would build up again to that larger classroom setting. Either volunteers or selected students would share their ideas and what they came up with with the whole class. Um, an example for my topic area would be, um, I'm going to do secondary social studies. So teaching about the concept of manifest destiny and westward expansion, um, the prompts could be, uh, the Painting American Progress from 1872 um, by John Gast. So I would put that up on the board. Students would see that and jot down some ideas on their own, maybe a couple bullet points. Then second, pair them in groups or just in pairs with each other and they could compare and contrast their ideas about how that painting relates to um, Manifest Destiny. And then um, third, they would either... Um, be selected or have volunteers to prompt a discussion with the entire class, so building up to that larger discussion. Um, so again, just some more benefits. It's not a typical cold call, cold call question to the class, um, which can be awkward if no one wants to talk. It engages the whole class and kind of avoids the trap of calling on those same few students every time. Um, it's not traditional group work, so all students have to do the work initially, not just a couple students who may be kind of freeloaders in, um, in a group setting. And then it's especially helpful, relating back to the chapter, for ESL students, special needs students, and more socially reserved students who might not normally participate. And just real quick, some questions for you to consider this week. Um, how would you model the ripple technique in your own discipline? How would you arrange students for the second step of the ripple technique? Would you do pairs, groups, and I want you to explain your reasoning. Why would you pick one or the other? And lastly, do you see any areas where you could improve the ripple technique for your own classrooms? Um, so thank you, and I look forward to reading your responses.